<laughs> Keep on going off, so right. I can tell. Um, it's a question about moral hazard, um, and it's about the likelihood of politicians actually ever enforcing higher regulation, since my observation is um, democratic politicians tend to love obscenely rich bankers and, and banks because they're, uh, as far as I recall, for about the last decade, the city paid about 15% of the total tax take in terms of corporation and individual tax. And the great thing is that most of those bankers don't actually have a significant vote, if any vote at all. So are democratic politicians ever going to regulate the bank seriously? I doubt it, personally. Who, who, who do you want to answer? This is directed at Peter, but of course others <laughs> might like to comment. Well, um, okay, the, Norway was very tough on its banks when it had its financial crisis uh, quite a long time ago. So that, that's one positive example. I can think of Kazakhstan recently, a dictatorship. Um, that calls itself a democracy. But no, I, I absolutely agree. And, and I, th I think that's why we called it the, the doomsday cycle. I, I don't see how that's going to break. Can I add something? Yeah. Could, 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 I just, could I just add a word to that? Because um, I fully agree with the rather cynical approach. But that's why a um, uh, framework to deal with uh, systemic issues has got to be made independent of the politicians. Um, it has to be legislated for in such a way that it's independent in a similar sort of way that monetary policy has got. Now, I know there are elements you can argue about quite how independent it is, but um, at least it's a starting point. Um, but I think otherwise your cynicism is very well justified. Yes. Um, see if I can get this. Uh, as uh, Adair and Sushil um, uh, explained, uh, they saw the economic role of banks as significantly different between developed and developing nations. If that indeed is true, why should we expect global regulation to be working or a, a sensible objective? Well, who wants to talk on the international side? Okay. Uh, well, well, well in, uh, uh, I mean, since Adair is not here, I'll take that. Um, I mean, I think it was more Adair than me who believed that, uh, that while f financial innovation might be a good thing in the emerging world, uh, he essentially thought that the benefit of financial innovation had peaked in the developed world and had possibly even turned around. And therefore, in that sense, while uh, he, he's willing to encourage financial innovation in emerging countries, well, he's here now, so he, uh, he, he can certainly help me answer. Um, uh, I, and therefore, he was drawing this distinction. Uh, I was m more uncertain about that distinction myself, uh, and, and therefore would be less convinced that you'd need different types of regulations uh, between countries. But uh, I'll let Adair answer the question. Yeah, Adair, uh, that was a, a question for you. Uh, why don't you repeat the question? Okay. That would be useful. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking forward to the answer. Uh, you can answer the question. Uh, as, as I think you proposed, the, the, um, you saw the, role of, uh, the economic role of banks as significantly different between emerged markets or developed and developing markets. Um, if that indeed is the case, why should we wish to pursue global regulation? Uh, on, a, on an equal basis. It would seem, to my mind, that if they have different risk appetites, that will be correct because they have different roles. Well, that's an interesting challenge and not one I had thought about uh, before. Um, the point I made was that uh, if, you, if you go back to the basic theory of is financial deepening uh, good? for market economies, and let's take one of the most simple measures of financial deepening, which might be bank assets as a percent of GDP. Um, I think there is a reasonable amount of uh, empirical uh, evidence that over a range up to a certain point, there is a positive correlation between GDP growth and bank assets as a percent of GDP. I think, I think it is the case that we've not really had the development of a market economy uh, which doesn't have some role for banks. There's, you know, so there isn't a, a, a growing market economy with 0% uh, banks to GDP. Uh, and that's because, you know, without banks, you've got a much more uh, uncertain process 
of putting together people who want to save money with people who want to um, invest money. And I talked about the way that the transformation processes lubricate that process and the way that Badgett argued that that was a, a useful thing. So over a certain range, and this is very much reflected in, as it were, you know, sort of Washington consensus, uh, financial deepening is, is, is a good thing. And I think over some range it probably is. I think it's highly likely, I think I'm right, that Indian bank assets to GDP are something like 15%, and I think it's probably highly likely that as they become a richer economy, that that will grow somewhat, and that that is not merely causation in that direction, but there's a bit of causation in the other direction, that the extension of basic banking services into the Indian villages is probably you know, a good thing. And what I was questioning was, is this a sort of good thing up to a point, or a growth-related thing up to a point, but beyond a certain point, um, you know, you just don't find the correlation. And indeed, in my chapter, I quote uh, a recent paper for the MBER uh, by Alan Taylor and uh, Maurice Schullerich, uh, which tried to look at precisely this issue, um, which argues that there is a correlation between these straightforward measures of financial deepening and some outputs in terms of growth rates up to some level of financial deepening, but that they can find no correlation beyond the sort of levels which the rich developed world had reached 30 years or so ago. So that's the, that's the background of what I was talking about, and, and, uh, and as I say, I re refer to this paper um, in my chapter. Um, I think I could probably argue, probably argue that even if we have global uh, capital requirements which are significantly higher than at the present level, we will actually get um, a, a constraint on further credit growth in the rich developed world, but growth elsewhere. I mean, I, I think you could get the result of continued financial deepening in emerging markets, but a constraint on further financial deepening in uh, uh, developed markets, even with the same capital requirements. And indeed, it's actually noticeable that at the moment that uh, emerging market banks are more highly capitalized than a, a developed world banks. Uh, and that, of course, partly reflects the fact that we thought we were so clever uh, with the Basel II uh, a advanced uh, ratings-based approach that we could, as it were, give a, uh, a, a benefit to the advanced and sophisticated banks of enabling them to run themselves on lower capital ratios. So um, the answer is I hadn't thought about your point before, and it's an interesting one. But I suspect that the answer is, even if we have globally agreed regimes, um, that that will be compatible with a further financial deepening in those countries where that is socially optimal and not in those that it isn't. But I need okay. to think further about that to make sure I really believe it. Thanks very much. Uh, the lady in front of, yes, and then the person behind. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask Charles Goodhart a question uh, on the theory that underpins the future of finance. Charles, you seem to have said that why regulate banks? There is monopoly which asks for competition policy. There is um, asymmetric information which would all be justified as microprudential regulation. And there is externalities, which is the macro view, I guess. Uh, and I happen to, I would like to know what is your, what do you, therefore explicitly endorse that externalities is really the issue with which we have to deal in, in dealing with the future of finance. You, however, mentioned also a fourth point, and that was intellectual capture. And it seems to me to be a big problem, especially when I now, towards the end of the whole day here, that we need to depoliticize. <coughs> It seems to me that all had been de depoliticized quite a bit and everything had moved into committees, technocratic committees, the whole regulatory policy. And while I can see the point, at the same time, there is a problem when bankers speak to regulators that they themselves have been ex-bankers or, you know, just the experts among each other. What would one do at the intellectual capture that, that has been part of the problem, in my view? I'm reminded of Keynes's statement about dictators distilling the supposed wisdom of, uh, of long-gone economists. Um, and I think that we were all intellectually captured. And that the capture was not really so much a capture of the regulators by the industry, 
It was the capture of everybody, including the regulators and the industry, by a set of ideas which turned out to be um, incorrect. And I think that the set of ideas was that as long as the banks were sufficiently capitalized, and that Basel II was supposed to provide that, that the banks could always access sufficient liquidity to meet any immediate problem by going to efficient wholesale markets. And we discovered that the banks weren't sufficiently capitalized for a variety of reasons. I, again, I think because of the, the doom, my doomsday machine and the combination of Basel II and Mark to Market being hideously pro-cyclical and the, the, the failing of markets. And as soon as people start distrusting the potential solvency or their counterparts, the wholesale markets break up very, very quickly. I don't think it, I don't think, I'm, no, um, and I'm always much more in favor of a cock-up theory than a conspiracy theory. Um, and I don't think that all this was due to um, uh, the <coughs> bankers waving huge checks at uh, legislators. I think that the real problems were that we had a set of ideas uh, primarily, I think, um, pushed by academic economists, uh, which led us into great difficulties. We were intellectually captured, uh, not by bankers, um, but by people like John, and Martin, and me. <laughs> John, <laughs> your turn to speak. Speak for yourself, John. <laughs> Richard? I mean, I discovered recently quite how long the history of regulatory capture was. In the United States, in 1887, they introduced regulation of railroad rates. Uh, in 1889, the Republicans won the White House, and a railroad lawyer became Attorney General. And when some of his clients wrote, saying, isn't it now time to get rid of railroad regulation? He wrote back and say, no, don't worry, it will operate to your benefit in the long run, as indeed, broadly speaking, it did. And some of the regulatory capture that takes place is corrupt. I mean, the relationship between Wall Street and American politics is pretty difficult to describe in any other terms. But it's not as crude as that here. It is that regulatory capture is the product of a particular kind of intellectual capture, which means it is very difficult to see the structure of the industry other than through the eyes of people who are currently in the industry. And that is intrinsic to any form of regulation that relies on the detailed monitoring of behavior. For me, we can spend decades railing against it, and no doubt will. But the only answer, the answer is not to, as it were, have less corrupt relationships. It's to design regulatory structures that are less vulnerable to this kind of endemic problem. I wanted to uh, comment on the uh, theory, and in particular, uh, the comments about the efficient market hypothesis, because the panel seems to share the view that this is the principal cause, particularly if I had to address my question to one person, Andrew Smithers. Um, I think his view of the efficient market hypothesis is incorrect. It, it doesn't say that um, prices are, are a random walk. What it says is that uh, if you include a risk premium, uh, then prices won't be a random walk. And this raises an important point, I think, because we've tried we know that in, fore in forecasting future prices, we, we have a set of information. That set of information might be complete, and that's reflected in the asymmetries that people have talked about. We've also tried to, uh, regulations have tried to remove asymmetries by removing um, insider trading. But most of the discussion today has, taken, um, has, has been about the risk premium. So if you include the risk premium in the um, no arbitrage relation between risky assets and the risk free asset, you could, you then, in effect, you store the efficient market hypothesis. But that doesn't mean, of course, but I think what, what the, today's discussion has really gone on to do is to try to, in a sense, re-establish the efficient market hypothesis with a risk premium. And so the whole emphasis on discussion today is how to measure risk correctly, and in particular, taking into account 
uh, a systemic risk and all the other risks that people didn't perceive. And I was particularly taking one, one final point about risk, is that according to Andy Hildane's numbers, <coughs> the more risky the economy, the higher is GDP, um, which isn't a very encouraging thought. I think I'm called upon to answer that. I did not say uh, what you're accusing me of saying. What I said was that in its former form, in which the efficient market hypothesis assumed that returns followed a random walk with drift, it was a testable hypothesis. I have not yet met anybody who has put forward a revised form of the efficient market hypothesis, which is testable. You can certainly assume some form of time-varying risk factor, which is compatible with the data that we have. But the question that I posed is that it's not then a testable hypothesis. And as such, it falls the wrong side of Karl Popper's famous demarcation between science and non-science. What I th also claimed is that in, its, in a revised form, which is possible, in which you don't say that markets are efficiently priced all the time, but they rotate around fair value, it becomes a testable hypothesis, and it is robust under testing. I was, n I was not attacking the possibility of it being possible to form mathematical models which account uh, for the apparent way that we, things happen. You can form many models, but if they're not testable, they are not proper hypotheses. And as far as I'm aware, the joint hypothesis problems it's known about uh, in the efficient market has not been disputed. But if you're going to say that you have a testable form of the efficient market hypothesis, then I'm delighted and I would love to see it tested. What I would say is that the efficient market hypothesis uh, emphasizes the important role played by risk, which is what the panel has identified in, in, in the book, I think. Well, if I go on on the risk thing, uh, not only do I think that the economic profession has fallen short uh, in the testability point, but I think it's also fallen short when, when pretending to test, uh, for example, the equity risk premium, the risk premium. This is true. The standard form of that is one in which you say that the risk premium uh, is a paradox because a certain model doesn't agree with the data. This is typical of economics. If your model doesn't fit the data, it is not so much a paradox as presumably your model is wrong. Uh, except okay. in the, uh, sorry, I think we should press on. No. Uh, person at the back. Thanks very much. Um, Oh, yeah, I was, wanted to ask the panel, I'll actually address this orally, I think. Um, I wanted to ask whether you go long or short on the chances of us avoiding another crisis of the same or uh, greater severity, given the current reform measures that are about to be pushed through. We're reaching a critical time here at Basel. We're about to set new capital uh, ratios. They're probably going to be around 10 to 11 percent, despite the fact that, um, as Peter pointed out, Layman's had a similar capital ratio. Uh, Eugene Farmer's been banded around here quite a lot. He suggested they should go up to 40 or 50 percent. Um, economists around the world are weighing up the, the costs and benefits of the new regulatory regime. Um, on the cost side, you've got anemic growth, five, ten years of anemic growth, potentially 1% instead of 3% we've all been used to as uh, private sector and consumers are weaned off uh, grossly excessive credit levels. Uh, on the benefits side, you've got the avoiding of a crisis that two of you have uh, today said will spell the end of capitalism in Europe. Um, I assume by that you're not talking about the safe transition to another model, rather you're talking about a collapse of capitalism which I would imagine is safe to assume would lead to the, probably the collapse of liberal democracy. So that's more on the, on the benefits side, you're avoiding the collapse of liberal democracy. Given that, what, what do you think the chances are that re the reforms we're going to be landed with in the next two or three years in this window of opportunity, what are the chances that they'll actually allow us to avoid another crisis of a similar or greater magnitude? Martin is going to answer. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> First of all, I can't comment on about these wonderful reform efforts because I um, have no idea. Um, there are, I just may, I'm going to make two very broad points. Um, I think um, um, Peter's point, the, the point about uh, uh, the, the, the doomsday machine sort of worries me. Um, 
<coughs> I'm not persuaded that it, that it, it, I am absolutely not persuaded that there is no way of securing growth in the world economy other than recreating the sort of leverage machine that brought us to this present pass. Um, if that is true, if that is true, then we are really probably already at the end of capitalism, as it were. Then we are in the. Uh, but I think there are very deep reasons for believing this is not the case. But it does mean that sets of reforms have to be large, radical, systematic, and coordinated. That may be impossible. Uh, that uh, uh, on the other side of it. So I think it's terrible to get trapped in this idea. If we have any serious reforms, growth will stop forever and ever and ever. That seems to be terrible. On the other hand, I have a very simple view of the next set of crises, and this is where I definitely agree with the dooms. It's pretty obvious that if we have a similar such crisis within a, the next 10, 15 years, a large number of Western governments will no longer be able to service their debt. That seems to me a pretty serious crisis. Adair? Um, well, uh, three points. First, on Martin's point there, there is absolutely no reason to believe that in the long term, a less leveraged economy is a more slowly growing economy. There's just no basis for it at all. It's not what history suggests. It's not what economic models suggest. Uh, it's not what uh, the empirical econometric analysis that we've, we, we're doing suggests. I mean, broadly speaking, uh, the UK uh, could grow at the same long-term growth rate with an aggregate private sector debt-to-GDP ratio of 60% as it could grow at 120%. And that goes back to you know, the fundamental forms of what credit is doing. Right? I mean, if, if that last 60% on top of the, you know, the difference between 60% and 120% is a set of contracts between you and me to shift um, uh, intertemporal consumption patterns, because you have one uh, a preference and I have another, there is absolutely no reason to believe that the absence or presence of those intertemporal consumption switching patterns has an impact on the long-term sustainable rate of growth. And I think we've just confused ourselves. I mean, after all, it didn't generate a high level of growth on the way up. I, I showed figures that showed that leverage figure going from 25% to 125% of GDP over the last 50 years. That did not generate on the way up a hyper period of growth. And when we got to that higher level, we do not have a higher sustained rate of growth than we did back in the 1940s and 50s when we had a debt to GDP ratio of 25%. So, and I think this is very important because some of the more simplistic models which are being put out uh, in the lobbying in relation to the capital and liquidity do come close to assuming that you can't uh, have a lower level of leverage without a lower rate of growth. And I think it is simply wrong. Um, secondly, I do think that we do have the capability and that we will put, to, put in place a set of measures which will significantly reduce uh, the probability, not of all uh, a, a crises, but of crises on the same scale that we've had in the past. And I do actually, I didn't get this morning to the bit of my speech, but it's, it, it's in there in the public version, of uh, what do we do about it. I think if we very significantly, and it is very significantly that we need to do it, increase capital and liquidity requirements, we can keep the benefits of what a banking system does, but we can constrain uh, its, its risks. And I think that will make a lot of difference. And I think we will agree uh, to get there. Will that cure the problem forever? No, it won't. I think it will cure it for 15, for 20, for 25 years' time, and in 30 or 40 or 50 years' time, we will fall into a this time it's different, new paradigm, everything has changed, we're so clever that we can run the system on lower capital and we'll do it again. But frankly, if we, the technicians, manage to reduce the periodicity of terrible crises from once every 15 years to once every 50 years, we'll have done a great job. So I am not deluding myself that this is forever, but I think we can make a big difference. But final point, and that relates to Martin's point, I do think we face a difficult transition problem because, although it is clearly not the case in economics that an economy needs to be at 125% debt to GDP to grow fast, versus 60%, as an as a exercise of comparative statics, there is no advantage of the higher leverage over the lower leverage. It is the case that once you are in a higher leverage position, 
it is pretty tricky <coughs> to crawl your way out of it. Now, there are some ways that you might call, crawl out of it, uh, because even if you are stuck there on fiscal policy, even if you're stuck there in private uh, debt uh, a ratios, you could also always use monetary policy, including unconventional monetary policy. And there are people like David Miles who've argued that there is no essential problem with deleveraging uh, which cannot be offset by an appropriate monetary policy response. And I think those ideas uh, need to be looked at uh, very carefully. But certainly we need to think very carefully in an environment where we're trying to create a more stable system out there in the future about how we go from A to B because there, is, there are asymmetries in here. Um, we don't get a growth benefit from driving up leverage in the first place, but it is quite difficult to bring down leverage uh, without uh, some uh, depressive effect on growth, particularly if at the same time fiscal policy is being tightened. And I think that is the nature of the challenge we face. Now, um, my uh, proposal is that we collect um, a number of questions, not more than half a minute each, um, that everybody here listens, marks, inwardly digests the questions, and then everybody here, one after the other, says whatever they want to say uh, <laughs> in relation to any of the questions or in relation to anything that's been said today, and that will, uh, I think, conclude it. So let, let's collect some questions. Yes. <coughs> We discussed the increasing levels of debt in, at all levels, household, state, uh, organization. Uh, my question is, what is the lesson w that we can take from this crisis with regard to intertemporal trade-offs? What is the lesson that we can take from the current crisis with this regard, given the fact that our life is limited, our lifespan is very limited? Thank you. Uh, yes? Uh, the TEEB report, uh, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, was launched uh, in the past few days. I'm holding it in my hand. I just wonder whether anyone has got a comment on how we value ecosystems and the biodiversity services that we're getting and factor that into the equation of the financial sustainability issues we're talking about. Thank you. It would seem to be a consensus across the panel that the two of the biggest problems that we have in the system by now is A, the presence of economic rent seeking in the system, and B, the instability of that system in the presence of any sparks. Now, to me, it would seem quite clear that both of those things are massively encouraged by the complexity of the regulation that governs the system. Now, what do you think about the fact that we are trying to throw more regulation to solve the problem, which in the first place encourages them to become so complex, um, in terms of regulation arbitrage and made it more opaque, which is one of the primary reasons why bankers are so able to extract economic rents from the system in the first place. Uh, in China at the moment, there's an interesting macro prudential policy going on with regards to trying to prick uh, what they believe is a, an emerging property bubble, um, not using interest rates, using specific targeted policies. Um, surrounding property. Is that something that the Bank of England should have done five to seven years ago, should be doing in the future or even now? Uh, and even if they should be doing it, um, uh, is it something that in a democracy is possible, i.e. giving some nasty medicine to long and wrong overly leveraged homeowners, which for the good of the rest of the economy they, they need to take? Thank you. Did the financial service sector make monopoly or supernormal profits in the 90s and the 2000s? If it did, was that due to the internal dynamic of the industry or was it due to regulation? Why weren't there more new entrants coming into financial services if the profits were so high? What prevented monopoly? <laughs> yes? How many years have we got until the next comparable crisis? Um, given that the um, 
sorry. Um, you know, given the cause of the crisis and all this leverage, it was this belief that there was no more boom and bust and a, a great moderation. Um, how much should public policy uh, aim to dampen credit, the credit and asset price cycle, and how much should it just accept it um, in the knowledge that, you know, if everybody knows that there is no more boom and bust, then they won't take on as much debt? Monetary policy and uh, fiscal policy are inevitably linked with macro prudential. Is there really a case for global agreement? Is there a place for what? Global agreement on macro prudential regulation, as Peter Boone suggested. Should there be a plan B if the various plan A's that we've discussed here do not, uh, do not really meet the issues and we do have another doomsday scenario and we are looking at a situation where Mrs. Smith can't get her shopping at Sainsbury's on a Saturday, should we put in place a state-owned bank, however undesirable that might be uh, at the moment, so that there would be at least a skeletal institution capable of providing money transmission services and uh, limited credit to the corporate, uh, the corporate sector if we had meltdown and another doomsday scenario which the state could not fund itself? Um, we, we heard uh, something about the, um, uh, what monetary policy can do to lean against a bubble on the way on, on, as it expands, but not so much about what monetary policy can do afterwards. I just wondered if the panel think that things might have been different if the Fed and other central banks had had a, a, a higher pain threshold in 1998, uh, the long-term uh, capital management and um, also the dot-com bust. I was wondering if the panel had any advice for the companies as users of financial markets. Could you say it again? Yes. Advice to companies. Advice for companies as users of financial markets. Does the panel have any suggestions for what they should be planning for? Thank you. Well, I think we've got some really, really good questions here. Um, I, I hope that uh, the, the law of matching will apply and that everybody will find an answer from what somebody uh, wants to say here. Uh, I suggest we simply go along from uh, my right to left, and our fittingly last, um, and it, each of you has a minute. <coughs> Uh, I, 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 the first question I wanted to address was to, to do with the Greenspan put. Uh, someone asked the, this question about uh, the asymmetry of monetary policy. Uh, I think it's been a very important phenomenon, uh, both theoretically and empirically. There is, I mean, th there are sound theoretical arguments for why this contributed to excessive risk-taking. There's the work, for example, by Diamond and Rajan. And on uh, an empirical level, uh, many years ago, uh, in a report I co-wrote, uh, we presented some evidence on how it had contributed to excessive risk-taking. And uh, I draw a lot of comfort from the fact that the BIS did a very detailed study recently, which came to similar conclusions. So, so certainly, I think that asymmetry um, was regrettable. Uh, I, I also, uh, Richard, if I may, wanted to pick up a couple of things uh, Adair said. Um, I, I genuinely think that the empirical evidence or th that, you know, that financial innovation has done very little in the developed countries recently uh, is, is actually seriously incomplete. Adair referred to this paper by uh, 
Alan Taylor. I don't know if Alan Taylor is here today, but I do know that in between the first version, which Adair has probably seen, and the second version, that uh, supposed evidence has got dropped. So I, I certainly wouldn't rely on it. And on the other hand, there are papers uh, essentially arguing that financial innovation has continued to play an important role e even until recently. Uh, the, the other point uh, that, that someone asked was about corporates uh, and, and what they, they make of all this. Um, and I was told a very interesting anecdote the other day by Jacques de La Rossier, uh, who has been involved in various activities about how we should amend financial regulation. And what he was saying is that, you know, that they've been reviewing all sorts of different ideas, all sorts of different options. And the thing that surprised them most is how much pushback they get from corporates uh, about some of the changes because the, the, the corporates uh, are hostile to the notion uh, of, of many of these changes which they think will make their cost of doing business much more expensive uh, and will ultimately hurt their profitability. I'll resist the temptation to say any more. <laughs> Thank you very much. Charles? Um, Marcus Miller at the end asked, how did the banks get away with it? Well, they were actually, in some respects, egged on by the politicians and certainly patted on the back by the, by the regulators. The summer of 2007, most regulators and most central bankers believed that the financial system had never been stronger. Capital ratios were higher virtually than they'd ever been. Profits were enormous, capital had gone up. And it was all, to some extent, largely based on an, on an illusion that was based on the underpricing of risk, massive underpricing of risk, and a completely fallacious belief that this kind of credit housing cycle could go on forever. And it was a, it was, it was a delusion. It was a delusion which everybody shared. And, and when you get to things like subprime, I mean, people now sort of demonize it. And you've got to remember that in 2004, 2006, this was regarded as one of the finest financial innovations had ever been. This was getting the disadvantaged of America onto the housing cycle. Question was, why weren't banks making enough of these kinds of loans? Not that they were making too many of them. And it was, and it, 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 in future decades, this will be, this whole sort of period, will be regarded as the great intellectual delusion. Um, and quite why we all, or virtually all of us, fell into this, is, this, is going to be a subject matter, I think, for psychologists and sociologists for decades to come. One other point on China, the question on China. Um, I am not in favor of uh, governments actually directing lending. I think that they do it in the wrong way. But I do think that some form of counter-cyclical margin requirements uh, maximum loan-to-value ratios, maximum loan-to-income ratios, which can be varied over time uh, on the real estate and housing sector. Because this, is, this has all been very much an interaction between real estate and housing. And it is, is as important to make sure that we don't get massive, huge cycles again in the housing markets and commercial property markets. And we need to actually uh, take measures, take steps, and use instruments to prevent that going, that, 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 that taking place again. And um, um, I think I'll probably s uh, stop there as Sushul. They gave us a, a splendid, don't try and do everything. Thank you, Charles. John. I'd like to make three points. One, spelling out a bit more what Charles has said. I think it's important we should recognize that the Basel agreements on international regulation based on capital requirements were rather worse than useless. Firstly, as Charles has explained, banks never complied with them more fully than in 2007. And in the period they, operate, uh, they, they operated, they had two negative consequences. One was to stimulate a variety of regulatory arbitrage in ways that reduce the transparency and simplicity of the system, and most seriously of all, to undermine management responsibility for determining what the appropriate capital structure of banks was. 
Second point is to say that I think we cannot overestimate the importance of the issues raised this morning by Andy Haldane. We, it is incredible to say that we do not understand or have good data on either what the contribution of the financial services sector to British national income is or what the sources of the alleged profitability of the financial services sector actually are. Given that the resources that are devoted to both research on the financial sector and the financial sector itself, that defies belief. The third point I'd like to make is that I think, in answer to one of the questions, the probability of another crisis is extremely high and not necessarily in, a, in, a, uh, in an extended time scale, certainly much less than the time scale Adair was talking about. One of the questioners raised the idea of should we prepare for that with a state bank? I don't think we should prepare that with a state bank. But I think we should have a contingency plan by which the state would take control of the payment system and the supply of credit in the event of a financial meltdown to prevent the kind of crisis uh, or to act in the kind of crisis we had in 2008. And if that sounds drastic, let us recognize that we do have such plans in the event of a failure in relation to major utilities or the supply of fuel, for example. It's not unimaginable, and I think it's necessary for this industry as well. Thank you.